Hi, this is Roland Orzabal from Tears for Fears. Um, I'm on the story behind the song on Consequence Podcast Network, coming your way. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Story Behind the Song podcast on the Consequence Podcast Network. I'm your host, Peter Chotti. And today I welcome Roland Orzabal from the great band Tears for Fears. And Roland, thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. And you are calling in from Massachusetts today. Southern Massachusetts, yeah. About an hour south of Boston. Yeah. Okay. And how, how did you end up in, in Boston, Massachusetts? It, well, I, I am very fortunate to be, to be married to a, a young lady called Emily Rath, who is actually from Denver, but she has links to Massachusetts. It's actually somewhere she would go as a kid uh, on holiday. And there, she has family here also. So that's great. why we're yeah. It's a great, great part of the world. I spent several years there. Yeah, it's lovely. It's really nice. It, it is. I spent several years. Um, so obviously everybody knows Tears for Fears, one of the most iconic bands in the 1980s, sold over 30 million albums worldwide, at least. Uh, and everyone knows the song Shout, Everybody want, Everyone Wants to Rule the World, and so many others. But true to its name, because we can't cover it all, in the story behind the song, we cover two songs. One that I choose from one of, one of the most iconic songs of the artist catalog. And today we're going to be talking about Mad World. Great song, breakout song from The Hurting, the 1983 debut album from the band. And then special treat today we're going to be talking about an upcoming a song from the upcoming or forthcoming album coming out in late february next year called the tipping Fo tipping point from the album of the same name so mm -hmm. that will be a wonderful preview of that song and what that's all about right but so first roland i wanted to get into a little bit of how you became a musician in the first place when you picked up the guitar, what motivated you to do that? And then ultimately just your journey into starting the band from childhood. Well, I was um, born in a, in a council house on a very large council estate called Lee Park, just outside Port, Portsmouth. Sorry, my teeth are slipping. Um, yeah, Portsmouth, all, all uh, good. South, south of England. Um, my parents ran an entertainment agency from the council house. So um, my my mum was a stripper. She would she would train strippers as well. And so I grew up with you know I would sneak down from my bedroom and and peek through the front room door, which was never fully closed, and I would see all these women practicing taking their clothes off while my father would sit on the sofa judging their moves mm -hmm. um so that that was one aspect the other aspect was the men that came around um the, the council house that were on the agency books uh were mainly country and western singers um so and my father again he would he would make tapes reel to reels of them to send out to um, other agents and promoters so I, 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 I fell in love with, for me, you know, the, the, the man with the guitar was the person to be, you know? And so I kind of grew up listening to sort of Elvis and Johnny Cash. And um, I wrote my first song when I was seven. This was before I, I, I learned the guitar. And I, I don't know why I was doing it. Uh, well, I do actually have a theory, um, and this this dates back to when I was about five. Now I was a very good reader at school, um, and I was a really I was an A student. So they asked me to read out a hymn uh, in assembly in the morning. So I I practiced reading it through with a teacher, but on my way home, skipping along in the afternoon, I thought, hang on a minute, hymns are supposed to be sung not read. So I made up this crazy tune, absolutely nonsense, crazy tune. 
And the next morning when, it, when I came to read the hymn, I started singing it instead. And the entire school started laughing and the teachers. And I kind of wonder sometimes whether that was kind of like that trauma may have set the wheels in motion of creating musical structure. <laughs> Interesting. It was, any, it was anything but structured. So age seven, a couple of years later, I wrote this tune and my, I sang it to my parents. They thought it was something that I got off the, the radio. I sang it to all the kids on the council estate and it was a hit among the kids in the council estate. So they immediately, they, it just immediately struck a chord or somehow they enjoyed it. Well, it was, it was a, a silly little tune. So, uh, right, right. But then um, I desperately wanted a guitar. And um, I think, my, I, yeah, so my, my mum bought a, like a, a tiny toy guitar and I had um, a magazine, sorry, a book called Burt Whedon Play in a Day. Um, so I, I learned three chords, but mainly two, C and G7. And then I wrote my first song um, on the guitar, which was a um, really like a Johnny Cash, a bad Johnny Cash thing. So that's how I started. But as um, I quickly learned that I could express whatever turmoil was going on inside me. So I became one of those kids that used music as a way of expressing himself. So when my parents split up, um, I ended up, we ended up living with my auntie and uncle not too far away. And I was pretty much going through a horrible time. And then I started listening to singles, you know, there were two, there was um, Walk Tall by um, Lonnie Donegan and What Do You Want If You Don't Want Money by Adam Faith. And these hmm. became my absolute go-to things whenever I didn't feel right. So that's really where I got kind of um, addicted to, to pop music and music making. So it sounds like um, music served as a bit of therapy in a sense right from your early from your early days that was your outlet based on all the things that you've described because certainly not the the most um i i, I don't want to say idyllic or the, not the most idyllic childhood in the sense of the way you described it but mm -hmm. getting your emotions out that way that was your place to go yeah it became um you know that sort of uh became my mind palace, if you like. Um, it was that place where I found with music, whether you're generating it yourself or whether you're listening to it on your own, you're not alone. That's, that was the beauty. And I think that um, isolation, loneliness, and, and it was not the environment to express any negative feelings whatsoever about uh, my mum taking us away from my dad. Mm -hmm. which was obviously the only thing she could do for her own safety. He was, he was quite physically abusive, mm -hmm. but, for, but for a kid, it was, you know, it was a, a major earthquake. Did you, um, do you recall the first, those first songs that you wrote? Are they still in your head? Yeah, they are, but I won't uh, be saying. No, yeah. not asking you to say, but that's, that's pretty fascinating that they stay with you. Yeah, did, yeah. did you know, did you think or, feel that you had a talent for it from your early days of writing and singing and picking up the guitar? I, I didn't have anything to judge it by, uh -huh. um, but I was one of those little kids. I mean, literally nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old, making up these songs. Yeah. So it was just something that I found immediately quite easy to do. I mean, obviously they weren't particularly good and it took me, uh, many, many years to sort of write something of, of a sufficient, you know, quality that, that, that anyone would want to listen to. So from those earliest days, tell us about the first band that you, um, that you created. Well, I always managed to um, rope my friends in 
to making music, even if they weren't musicians. Yeah. I remember when I was, again, I was nine. And this uh, sounds crazy. Um, I used to get all the, the guys to come around. All my friends would come around to our house and we would bang on these metal heaters. We would make an absolute racket and we would try and recreate some of the um, hits of the day. Um, I remember walking, there was, we walked through a graveyard on the way back from school when I was nine and we were singing at the tops of our heads. And, call, and then we were called up in front of the school, told off again for making music. Um, so I'd always, I had, I don't know what it was. I mean, even when I, I moved um, to Bath, uh, again, from into a smaller house, mm -hmm. a kid down the road, uh, Paul uh, would introduce me to heavy, heavy metal music and rock music, which I kind of struggled with because I was a pop kid. And I taught him to play bass. So we, we, we formed a band pretty immediately. So that was, must have been age 13, 14. Um, I then, because I was more adept at playing guitar than anyone else my age, I used to teach guitar at school as well, um, just a few kids. And you know, I taught Kurt to play bass. He'd never picked up a guitar before then. So, I, so he, I'd he, was, he, he was a neighborhood, he was a neighborhood kid. He, he met through, um, through Paul. We met Paul. Through, through Paul Noble. And yep. uh, yeah, and then we, we formed a band with Kurt, and it was a kind of um, not a very good heavy rock band. Yeah. Called Graduate. No, this was, this, this was before, this way before Graduate. So huh. this was no, 14, 15. Um, we didn't do many shows. Um, I think we were called Ducks with a Z, with a Z, sorry, Ducks. Um, and we would do Stairway to Heaven, bits of Blue Oyster Cult. Uh, and it was, I, 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 luckily there were no recordings. Then, you know, as I said, I taught guitar at school. Yeah. And the, the, the guys I taught guitar to, we formed a folk band. And there was so, such comedy and wit among those guys. It was crazy that we would do these shows in a, in a local youth club. And half the time we would sing, like Simon and Garfunkel and things like that. And other times we would just crack gags. And it was just a great experience. So that was going on side by side. Out of that band, funnily enough, I formed Graduate with John Baker, um, who was my uh, best friend and still is a, a very dear friend indeed. And that, and that was a heavy metal band somewhat. Graduate, right? graduate became, no, we became, we went, went from doing playing Simon and Garfunkel songs in a hairdresser okay. on a Saturday morning. <laughs> to then sort of um, morphing into this kind of um, uh, pop band, sort of mod band. This was the age of, of the jam and two-tone. So we were like a really, really bad version of that kind of stuff. We were still young, 17, turning 18. But th that was when... I got my first record contract um, when I was 18 with Graduate. Was Kurt in Graduate? Graduate, yeah. We went through um, a series of bass players and none of them stuck. Uh -huh. So uh, it was when we were morphing into this sort of more of a, a pop band with an image that I thought, well, Kurt, Kurt's a, a good looking boy. He looks like a pop star in the making. <laughs> um, so I sort of sneaked along to his, um, his flat. I taught him all the bass parts and he was, you know, give him his due. He was very, very good at it. He picked it up like that. Um, so he came in, but that was, you know, it's sort of that maybe upset things politically, if you know what I mean, because Kurt and I were maybe slightly different values from the rest of the band and it was only, uh, we were only together for maybe a year when Kurt and I went off on our own into an entirely different direction. Which is pretty interesting when at such a young age, you signed a deal, a signed yep. a, a label deal with mm -hmm. Graduate. And then you, in such a short period of time, you transitioned. Yep. And Gary Newman was one of the reasons why? Absolutely. You see, we'd had a bit of radio success with... Um, 
graduate um, on Radio One in 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 the UK, and also we had a minor radio hit in Spain. So I was already used to sort of going off and doing TV shows. Um, there were a whole bunch of um, Spanish young ladies outside our hotel screaming, and it's like okay. So that was a little bit of a test, uh, taste. But one day, um, so we were big into the two-tone, big into the ska, big into the mod music. One day, Kurt and I were up in um, his flat listening to Radio 1 and it was straight in at number one or something like that, Gary Newman's um, Our Friends Electric. And we just went, whoa, what the hell is this? And why is it so popular? So we we literally scratching our heads thinking, well, how can we do this? And then there were other, these other bands emerging like Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, Depeche Mode, of course, Human League. And then we were into an entirely different area of music and it was kind of, well, the, 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 the duo became very popular then. You know, you had your, your rhythmics, soft cell, so that was something because we hated all the sort of touring with graduate, not that we did much, but the two weeks in Germany was enough to convince us. And we, again, at the same time as this was happening, um, this guy called Ian was floating around um, and offered the use of his demo studio. So that again, allowed Kurt and I to go off and just be a duo. Mm hmm. Well, it, so that was such a pivotal time in the music in the music world, the, the transition. And I just recently had the good fortune of also interviewing Gary uh, yeah. ab about his beginnings and a couple of the songs and that era and how influential he was. So, Roland, you told us about how you transitioned from the graduate, your influences from Gary Newman and yeah. your, your childhood is obviously foundational as you get into the hurting. But you tell us whether you felt that this was a you know, what what the impetus was to create the sound for the hurting and the concept for the hurting rather than me try to guess it you connect yep. the dots and and take me through that sure well as i said um kurt and i had a different um i think a take a different take on life because i think we came from than the rest of the, the guys in the graduate i think we came from a little more troubled background so both of us, first of all, had a lot of anger and resentment at our, at our parents. We kind of sort of blamed them for a lot of things that many, many people would just let go. Not, not me and Kurt, no. Um, my guitar teacher, a lovely lady called Pauline Moore, one day all of a sudden said she was going to Los Angeles to do a thing called primal therapy. And I was just like, what, what the hell is that? And why? And she explained she wasn't happy with the things that happened in her childhood. She wanted to explore them. She wanted to express them. She wanted to let them out and let them go. So she gave me a copy of the primal scream by Arthur Yanov and I read it and it was like, it was like the heavens opened. It, you know, and this beam of light came pouring down and all of a sudden, everything made sense. Everything. And I gave the book to Kurt. He felt the same way. So we were unified in um, accepting and believing Arthur Yanov's take on the world, which is essentially, that, you know, that the child is born a blank slate, a tabula rasa, and then it's all the traumas of birth and everything shape the way we are. Now, it's one way of looking at things. Um, it's not something that I necessarily agree with nowadays, but at the time, the fact that he could promote the child as a victim worked so well um, with, with how Kurt and I felt. So I started writing a whole series of songs which was essentially to express that, the woe is me, all of a sudden tapping into my feelings of isolation and resentment, feelings of, you know, I was 
without doubt, not clinically depressed, but I was um, experiencing a lot of depression because I really didn't know what was going to happen to me in life. And I was one of those A students who needed the structure of school, but the wheels came off and something deep within my psyche was begging to come out. So this was the environment I was living at the time um, away from home with my girlfriend, Caroline, who became my wife. And we were living in the center of Bath in a small two bed flat above a pizza place and right next to the Theatre Royal. Caroline had a lot of faith in me. She'd seen me play with graduate and she thought I was gonna do something. Um, so she was happy to go out and get a couple of part-time jobs and do bar work and waiting. So I was sat at home with my acoustic guitar pretty much, you know, five days a week. And with Mad World, there were a few things floating around. Firstly, I was, I was a huge fan of the Paul Simon song, Still Crazy After All These Years. Well, I sit by the window and I watch the cars. I'm sure I'll do some damage one fine day. So this, this idea of being slightly removed from everything. And that's what I would do. I would sit at the window of the flat and I would look at people going to work, you know, the daily races um, and not feel any part of it. The other thing that happened at the did, time... Let, let me ask you one question about it. Did you, as you looked at them, did you feel sorry for them? I kind of... Like pity, pity for them? Not pity. I felt I didn't understand why people were just, you know, robotically going about their business. I mean, I do now. <laughs> it's quite simple. They're trying to make money and survive. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. at the time, being sort of like, you know, unemployed, I was unemployed, so I was being, you know, the state were paying paying for me, albeit 14 pounds every fortnight. Right. But yeah, I, I couldn't understand it. Some part of me thought that I was maybe destined for greater things. I don't know what it was. Maybe I was just being a snob or an elitist. But yeah, I was, um, but most of all, I guess I felt detached. So, I would often listen to Radio One. I was obsessed with modern music, modern hit music. Um, and I was young enough for it to, you know, for me to fit in with it completely, to absorb it, to regurgitate it. And I mean, this, this might sound a bit crazy of how I got from listening to Radio One to the song Mad World. But there, it was Duran Duran, um, girls on film and of course the tinny nature of the small um, speaker emphasized the the guitar riff so I'm going so I had that rhythm that's how it started that's interesting I was going to ask you about the, the, how you got into the rhythm but go ahead well then so I I, I quickly wrote the guitar uh, so the guitar parts based on that rhythm and the the lyrics came very quickly and again it's the um the the child as victim courtesy of half a of children waiting for the day they feel good happy birthday happy birthday so i had this song i'm not sure i, I must have played it to kurt but it it really didn't sound very good a with me singing it and B, as this sort of up-tempo guitar thing. I mean, even if I played it to you now all these years, um, you, you, it just doesn't, didn't make sense. As I said earlier, we were working with Ian Stanley in his demo studio up in his house, and he had, uh, correct, I, mean, I could stand corrected if I'm wrong about this, a CR78 drum machine, which used to provide sort of bossa nova beats for um, people who played ham and organ. Very, very simple drum machine. Um, but you could also program it. And it was programmed in steps. It wasn't easy. 
But the first thing I did was try and take the guitar rhythm and put it on the CR-78. So do, do, dit, do, dit. It was very, very light because it didn't have any of the toms that were later added by Chris Hughes when we mastered it. Um, the other thing that Ian had was a thing called an MXR pitch transposer, which I God knows why he had it, because it was barely ever used. But I put the CR-78 through that and pitched it down so it had a dual tone with a thing called regen, regeneration. So then you got more of a kind of complex rhythm. Blue, blue, blip, blue, blip, blue, 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 blip, blip, blue, blip. And the, the third thing um, Ian had was a Roland JP4 synthesizer. So I, I picked a bass drone and started recording it. I sang it. And again, I just, it just didn't. Nothing was appealing to me, nothing whatsoever. I said to Kurt, as I often did then, you know, all right, you have a go. And he sang it, and then all of a sudden, boom, that was it. And again, it's one of those songs that the people who have sung that song well over the decades have a kind of a tone to their voice, which is effortless and not particularly loud. Um, not, not heavily articulated, no vocal gymnastics. And so that was, but having said that, still after that demo had been done, we were just gonna use it for the B-side for our single pal shelter. Mm -hmm. Until uh, the record company heard it and said, that's not a B-side, that's your next single. That's, uh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, yep. But it sounds like you, you came from this band that was the grad or graduate. That was a very different sort of vision. Yep. You were influenced by the sound that was evolving. Gary Newman, Duran Duran, um, which is fascinating. Great song, by the way, Girls on Film. Uh, and kind of the, 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 the beat, as you said. But then you went into the studio and there were all these different instruments around. Sounds like a lot of serendipity came into play here as you explored what they were capable of and and that evolved into how the sound of mad world came to be exactly um serendipity yeah i'm not quite sure what we would have done if uh, we hadn't found uh, or if ian stanley hadn't approached us i'm really not sure i mean we we did uh, suffer the children with a guy called david lord in crescent studios david had produced peter gabriel's fourth album he had a synclavier, so we were putting synthesizers on that, which he largely played. But that never allowed me the opportunity to explore synthesizers, which I ended up absolutely loving. Now, the thing is, this is the other thing I didn't mention to you, that I, I had played in an orchestra at school. Mm -hmm. I had sung in a choir, I'd played in a brass band. I used to play the trumpet very, very badly. So when it came to making up sounds on, on, on a synthesizer, I was drawn to the, the, the fact that you could orchestrate things without relying on guitar. But you were, so you were about 18, 19 at the time, right? 19, yeah. um, but you had no background in those particular instruments no. that, and it was tinkering. It was exploring the yeah. kind of the rainbow of sounds that came out of them. I think sometimes the fact that you can't play uh -huh. that's it you know because you're literally on you're, you're playing one or two notes and that's kind of the magic of the simplicity of the arrangements so tell me about ian stanley um yep. that as you said you know thankfully you met him because yep. he then became this believer in what you were doing and then ultimately he and the record company chose mad world as as a single yep. but Tell me in the audience a little bit about him and how you connected with him. Well, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a strange one. I mean, Ian was sort of floating around Crescent Studios. I'm not quite sure whether, where he came from, to be honest with you. I just remember him. He was tall. He, he had very strange footwear. Um, he, didn't really have, he didn't really have any sense of being hip or fashionable 
or anything like that. He was also a little older than us. And he just seemed very uncomfortable in his body, if you know what I mean. And he had hooked up with the other members of Graduate. That was what was strange about the whole thing. Um, but through them, I think they were sort of, you know, probably gossiping and, you know, bad mouthing me and Kurt. But in the meantime, while they were doing that, they were kind of saying, yeah, but Roland is bloody talented. Yeah. So we were kind of going, okay, well, maybe I should, maybe I should meet that guy. So he approached us in the um, Moles, uh, which was a vegetarian restaurant in the day, a discotheque oh. night. And he offered us the use of his um, recording facility and, you know, Kurt and I, you know, from C Council House Kids, and we went up to this this house, which kind of looked like a ski chalet. It was quite sort of modern in the south of Bath, up a hill. And we walked in. I think the first thing I said to Ian was, is this your dad's house? And it wasn't. So I'm guessing he must have been early 20s, and he was married to a woman, a woman called Oscar, that was her nickname, and she was the daughter of a, a Cypriot, Greek Cypriot millionaire. I think that's how they afforded the house. And he had a grand piano in there, and and this sort of for for, for me and Kurt, it was like, whoa, this is this guy must be loaded, yeah. It was a complete antithesis to where we were coming from. But so was he, was he an established player in the music scene? No, I mean, no, not at all. And uh, again, I'm not quite sure where he came from, whether he was local or whether he moved here. Or, yeah. I think it was local. I'm not, but no, I mean, I, I would say that, uh, you know, he provided us the, 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 the place and, and the, the musical equipment. Um, I'm, not, I'm not being harsh and I'm not being funny, but I'm not sure if he really knew how to, how to use it. Because Kurt, by that time, Kurt and I had done two albums at, at Crescent Studios with Graduate. Uh -huh. And so we, when we were the guys who would sit at the mixing desk saying, change the snare sound, do this, we were the guys who were obsessed with sound. Um, and also the desk that Ian had, it was tough to, you would muck about with the knobs and the EQ and we would barely make any difference. So we were notching, notching EQs on everything. And we were, you know, we were big fans of the Peter Gable 3 album using drum ambience. So all of a sudden we were setting up snares in bathrooms. And, and it was, I think for, for Ian, it was kind of like, whoa, this is, this is, this is interesting. And it, it took him a while, but in the end, he, he got it. Well, yeah, uh, obviously he had good ears, right? He, 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 yeah, I think so, yeah. It was an, yeah. It was, it was an exciting time, very exciting. Yeah, no, it was a great time. Um... Uh, I, I love that time, that transition of the kind of what was happening in the 70s and then going into the early 80s. And you it, for this particular song, you mentioned that it, the beat kind of came to you first and then you added the lyrics later. So is that no, I had, your... no, I had the lyrics with the song, um, but I didn't like it on guitar. So that's uh, what. Yeah. So what is your usual process in writing or is there one where lyrics come first, music? Well, I would say that if you have, um, it, it varies with, with every song, for instance, Sowing the Seeds of Love, I'll give you an example. Um, that, that, came, that was a title before it was a song. That came from listening to a Radio 4 show talking about um, a gardener called Mr. England going around um, copywriting all these ancient traditional songs, and one of them was Seeds of Love. Hmm. So I thought, Mr. England, a gardener, sowing the seeds of love. So I had that title. Um, with, with other songs, you know, I mean, a song like Mad World, it doesn't take much of a jump to use those words. Um, Shout again came out of the ether when sort of mucking about and putting myself into that semi-hypnotic trance, which you can when you're allowing your your... You, the right hemisphere of your brain to become fully dominant. Um, so, yeah, everybody wants to rule the world. That was used to be initially was everybody wants to go to war, which was would never have been uh, 
anywhere near as good. So it really does vary. But I, I, the general rule is I use vowel sounds. So when I'm writing, I would do dab, or you know, all kinds of gobbledygook. And, and sometimes I would record the vowel sounds and I would, there's a song called Mr. Pessimist on Elemental, where I listened to the vowel sounds over and over and over again and wrote the lyric to match the vowel sounds because the vowel sounds were the things that were the most musical. Hmm. And yeah. it still matters, yeah. Yeah, no, I interesting. Um, and the, the album itself, the, the Hurting, so we kind of understand the backdrop of it. Concept mm -hmm. album, would you say? It, it yeah, it was um, without a doubt. I mean, in, in a sense, I mean, people say, you know, what is Tears for Fears? What, what things most represent Tears for Fears? The Hurting, in a sense, is the most true Tears for Fears album, without a question. That's how we started. That's what we were into. We were literally ripping um, words out of the Arthur Yanov's Primal Scream, Primal Man in New Consciousness, Prisoners of Pain. You've got songs called Ideas as Opiates. Um, on the hurting from a chapter from one of his books. You've got The Prisoner based on Prisoners of Pain. I mean, it's, it's all pretty straightforward. Yeah. But quite unique. And to yeah. clarify things, we weren't the only people to do this because the most famous proponent of primal theory and primal therapy and primal scream, of course, is John Lennon, mm. Mm -hmm. who um, allegedly did six months, and that led to the writing of mother ah. yeah yeah interesting and then you know just just following up a uh, final questions about that and then we'll take a break and we'll get into the tipping point uh but the album itself self and now i understand a little bit more is quite percussive you have the xylophone sounds that seem to be flowing from change as an example so there's a lot of percussive element that's in that um uh in in the album uh, and so the evolution of that is now I, I understand that a little bit more. I want to ask you one thing about some of the lyrics. When you talk about the daily races and mm -hmm. we had that conversation, if you weren't, if you didn't become an artist, if you didn't meet Ian, where do you think you would have gone <laughs> from a career standpoint? Well, God knows. I mean, when I was at school, uh, I wanted to, my first, um, instinct was to become a maths teacher can you uh, imagine yes <laughs> i can based on what you told me absolutely um then my next instinct was sort of um to become a language teacher or, or and i was due to study either um french or french literature or french and psychology because that was the other thing that i was interested in but i have no idea i mean i've been writing books, you know, I take photographs, something, it would have had to have been creative, I think, at some point. Yeah. And the name of the band yep. came from Janov. Yes. So tell us just quickly about that. Well, we were looking for names and uh, Kurt walked in one day and he said, what about Tears for Fears? It was um, essentially based on the, the, the line Tears as a replacement for fears. So, you know, again, catharsis and the expression of emotion as a way of resolving, um, you know, in, in a sort of turmoil. In the Janov book. Yeah, I don't think the, the line is specific, but that's the thing that inspired Kurt. Yeah. And then final qu uh, question. One of the lyrics that I always, I, I think many people didn't, fully understand whether they were correct when they would sing them, when we yep. would sing to ourselves, is the Mondegreen, which I never even heard that word before, and I, I'd like to think that I know quite a few words. The Mondegreen, which is a lyric or a word or something that you misunderstand that's flowing from something. And at the very end, where Kurt Sing sings what I always thought was illogical world, and many other people said other things, it actually is Halargian world. Halargian. And yeah, so tell, tell the audience about that. Well, that was uh, when we were mastering it, uh, when we were doing the, the recording that everyone knows now uh, with Chris Hughes and Ross Cullum up in London. And Chris 
had many sort of private gags and, and little bits of obscure parlance. And one of them was about the planet Halage, um, which I still to this day do not understand. Um, so I think it was Kurt it's just twisted it around. And it was, it was more to please Chris, I think, than, than anything else. So Halagian. And then when uh, Gary Jewell sang it, he sang Enlarging, which I, I like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Enlarge, an enlarging world. Interesting. And so now we know a little bit more about Halargian world, which is uh, in my, you know, reading up on things a little bit before the podcast, that was fascinating because I've listened to that song hundreds of times over the course of my life and I never knew what that was. And Gary Jules got it wrong. Um, yep. And an interesting twist of fate, by the way, six degrees of separation. So the Michael Andrews was the, was the sound producer or the music supervisor, the musician actually for Donnie Darko, the great. He was doing the soundtrack. He was, he was... Yeah, the soundtrack. And one, one of my favorite movies of all time, Donnie Darko, great movie. Uh, but he was doing the soundtrack. Michael Andrews happens to be the uncle of my daughter's roommate right now in college. And wow. so I just, I had to mention it. I had to bring a shout out to Nicole Andrews and to the Andrews family. So there's a little connection there and they're all right. studying music at USC right now. Wow. But, so um, let's, let's talk about Donnie Darko and you know what, what you, how you feel about Gary Jewell's very different version, which became a massive hit itself uh, around the world, and in fact became the number one Christmas song in the UK in 2003. Yeah. So tell us about that. Well, the, the, my, the first thing I knew about it was, th this was the day before, um, before email. So I had a fax machine in the office in my recording studio in the garden, in England and this fax came through from the publishers saying you know this film Donnie Darko produced by Drew Barrymore by the way so that was the thing that struck me oh Drew Barrymore yeah wow she's doing a film this is interesting and they wanted to use Mad World they didn't say in what context particularly or maybe I just didn't even read you know a small amount of money signed off on it forgot about it absolutely forgot about it the next thing I know, it must be a year, at least a year later, my ex-manager, um, Deborah, came across from LA. She had a, um, a CD of the soundtrack, Donnie Darko. Now, she, she said, you've got to listen to this. So we, we put it on in the kitchen in the house in England. And my younger son must have been, uh, must have been seven? Maybe, maybe even younger, I can't remember, six. And he's very musical himself, very musical, Pascal. Um, and so this, this song started and it was absolutely beautiful. And shivers were running up my spine. As he, Gary, sang the words that I'd written that never fully understand, understood how beautiful and poignant they were. This was a new way of doing the song in, a, in, in, in its ultimate form by someone else. And the weirdest thing about this point in time was my son Pascal started singing it. Children waiting for the day they feel good. Happy birthday, happy birthday. He was singing those lyrics to me, his dad when I wrote them about being a child. Yeah, it's beautiful. It, it was like, oh my God. Because what's what happens when you become a parent? Your inner child gets buried. You've got real, real children to deal with. And when with Pascal singing that, it was the most, one of the most incredible experiences, musical experiences I've had. Yeah. So you, um, when you, allowed the the uh the movie the film yep. to use your song mm -hmm. is at the time did did you feel like as a songwriter 
when somebody does that and takes it to reinterpret it or reimagine yep. it themselves, is that something that is a scary thought? Do you feel like you're losing control? Do you, and this worked out really well here, but how do you feel about that? Well, I feel amazing because I mean, we just, um, Kurt and I have just been awarded a, a, an Ivor Novello for our back catalog. So this is kind of relevant. And we were awarded that because of what, of what has happened to that catalog over the decades um, where the songs have been reinterpreted by younger artists, okay? So there's a difference between songwriting and being an artist. There are plenty of extremely successful songwriters around the world who people do not know at all. And there's a, there's a joy about watching something that you created take on a life of its own. I mean, once a song is released into the world, you don't have any control over it anyway. And it will do what it will do. Fantastic if it does extremely well. You know, nine times out of 10, it does moderately well or, or not even well at all. Yeah. Well, it's pretty brilliant uh, that reimagining as well, which is so different from your recording of the song and it's effective in just very different ways Absolutely. and so that could be an entire episode too of how gary jules and michael andrews thought to take this song that's a very your song and how the recording was to reinterpret it the way that they did which became a smash hit all over the place and as i said strangely enough as i was reading up on it the number one christmas song in 2003 which is fascinating and um, and and then Donnie Darko, an, another Tears for Fear song, another one of your songs, your recording, Head Over Heels, is another pivotal. It's part of the storyline no. in that film. So Donnie Darko is an amazing film. I'm, I'm just curious. How did you feel about the end result of the film itself? Well, I love the film. I mean, it's, um, I feel very privileged to have it, been any part of it. Yeah. And even the use of Head Over Heels, and I don't even think they, they play the chorus. So it's, it's Head Over Heels without the chorus. Yeah. Um, and it, it's just a magnificent uh, soundtrack. I think Michael Andrews is a bit of a genius. Yeah. Uh, thank you for taking us through the journey through Mad World. So many other questions I could ask, but I want to I want to dig into the second song, because, again, true to the name of this podcast story behind the song we talk about one of the most iconic, but here we're going to talk about a your the song that I asked anything that you wanted from your own repertoire, and you chose the tipping point from your forthcoming album, the tipping point, which is your first in almost two de two decades, seventeen years. That's going to be coming out late February, and yep. so I was fortunate to be able to hear the song. Good. Um, I look forward to the world to being able to hear this song and congratulations. It's another beautiful song. Tell us about, first of all, the backstory of why after 17 years, this is your first studio recording as Tears for Fears. Why now? How did that, how did you get the motivation at this point in time to, to write and record and release this album? Well, firstly, um, we back in 2004, 2005, we released an album called Everybody Loves a Happy Ending. Now, the narrative behind that album was purely Kurt and I getting back together again to make a record. That was it. There are no deep and meaningful uh, messages within the songs. It's in a sense, it's like Seeds of Love's, Seeds of Love's younger brother. Um, we had a lot of fun, uh, moved the family to L.A. Um, we spent about two years there having an incredible time, change of lifestyle. It's a very sunny album. Um, there's a lot of great songs on it. We would, you know, as very luckily, you know, the single went straight on, um, on to the Radio 1, that's Radio 2 um, A-list. Got a lot of play. We were doing things like um, Ellen in the States, and then we would look at all the sales figures. And essentially what was happening were, was that people would be going out and buying the Greatest Hits record. 
and not the new album. So what we were doing was we were regenerating interest in us, but not selling new records. Now that, that was, so this is way before streaming. And that was the case for many older artists, Paul McCartney, Rolling Stones, sell out tours, don't sell any records. So we, we went into this kind of um, period where we were touring. We became um, a very good live act. Over the years, we were picking up new mu musicians. Um, it was a very harmonious time. We wouldn't tour for too long. Um, so that, that kind of was satisfying us, if you see what I'm saying. We didn't feel, I, I got into writing books and we lived, I lived in, in England and sort of semi-retired. And we would get together and every now and again, do these great shows, feel the love, and then go back home. I, I think it was um, a manager, a guy called Gary Gersh came along. He, he, he bumped into Kurt in LA and said, well, what are you doing? And Kurt said, well, not, not a lot. We're doing a bit of this, a bit of that. And he said, well, you should be making records. And that really spurred on the making. But that was back in 2013, maybe? Mm. 2014? No, even before then. So that was a long time ago. And then we had this um, very, very difficult few years of trying to find what we were looking for. Gary listened to what we had and said, you're not going to, didn't believe we could make the record ourselves. You know, we were too stuck in our ways. You know, our heyday was a long, long time ago. So we, we, we set off on this sort of what we call speed dating writing with young modern songwriters. And we pursued that for, for, for many years too. And but, but by the end of, by 2016, we had an album of 12, pretty much 12 attempts at a modern hit single, whatever that is, because it's already changed since then. And uh, the record company Universal took a couple of songs, put them on a greatest hits record. Again, another greatest hits record. Mm. Does extremely well, of course. And then we were left with this pared down album, which Kurt and I soon realized was not representative of Tears of Fears. It was the early 2020 when Kurt and I had a kind of crisis meeting. Let me ask you a question about that. When you say it wasn't representative of Tears for Fears, what do you mean by that? It, again, it was, there was no narrative. It was, mm, I see. Songs were, what, what are the messages of the songs? What are you trying to say? How, how is what you're doing in your, now in our 50s, how is that any better than what younger kids are doing? No, it wasn't. You know, so... And it was, I think it was tiring to listen to. There was no dynamics, but as I said, there was no narrative. Even though all these horrible, traumatic things were happening in my life, there was no, what's the word, resolution to that. So although I referred to it in some of the songs that were on the, what I call the broken album, we took half of it and when we, re re we recorded more. Um, it was only from the beginning of 2020, so this is pre-lockdown, mm. um, when I got together with Kurt, um, had a bit of a crisis meeting, met up with acoustic guitars in his house, something we hadn't done for many decades, for many for decades. And um, we came up with a song called No Small Thing, which is track one on the album, and then we were all into a different phase entirely. And very quickly, we got five, five new songs and finished the album at the end of 2020. And what would you say is the concept, the, the Tears for Fears glue that holds this together, this new album? Well, I mean, you know, as I said, lots of bad things happened. Um, so you have a couple of very emotional songs, one, one the, the tipping point in itself, another ballad called Please Be Happy. But you can see, you can feel a shift in the emotional nature of the album and songs, as especially in a song which is probably my favorite, 
written um, during lockdown and during the riots, uh, a song called Rivers of Mercy. So you can feel sort of the heart opening. Mm. And it's quite, it's quite um, yeah, it's quite uh, uplifting. Tell us about the Tipping Point, yep. that song, and the origins of that. Well, we've been working, we did Everybody Loves a Happy Ending with a guy called Charlton Pettis, who is our co-producer, co-writer, and also our, our live guitarist. And Charlton was a bit miffed that we were going off and working with all these other songwriters who were essentially taking bits of trade, trademark TFF, trademark Tears for Fears, you know, the shuffle from everybody, the riff from Head Over Heels, trying to concoct something that, right. you know, that, w- that would work, and it never does. So Charlton, having absorbed, um, you know, Tears for Fears, it was now in his DNA, sent me through this odd backing track with this beautiful haunting theme at the beginning. And it was in, you know, 12, eight or whatever you want to call it. And he'd put in all these odd bars and, and he had this lovely chorus um, piano motif. At the time, um, Caroline, who we talked about earlier, was very, very ill and becoming, you know, a, a ghost of a former self, if you want. So that's how the narrator in the song Tipping Point is in a hospital ward watching someone as they pass from life into death and not knowing exactly the point at which they 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 pass on. Mm. Because when you've been close to someone for decades and decades, you, you, you are keeping them alive. Mm-hmm. So the question in the song says, will you ever know when it's the tipping point? Okay. And I don't think you do because even through the process of grief and through mourning, they're still very much alive in our memory. Yeah. Um, I, I really feel you on that. I'm not equating this at all, mm-hmm. at all. But I just three months ago experienced that with my mother. And okay. so I, I really like, I really feel what, how you're describing that. And I'm not equating it at all because it's a very different situation. Um, but one of the lyrics and they're beautiful lyrics and the story, mm-hmm. I understand now where it's coming from. Uh, but I want to ask you about them. Uh, these lyrics, will you let them out? Will you let them in? And again, everybody out there, this is from the forthcoming song. I think it's going to be the first single released from the forthcoming album, uh, but the song, The Tipping Point. Well, it's, it's quite simple. It's, will you let them out? Will you let them go? Mm-hmm. So, you know, they are, I mean, I've seen a lot of TED Talks on, on death and dying. I've read mm-hmm. books. Um, a lot of people are actually ready to let go. They are more ready to let go than we are. And that's what's tough about the whole thing. So it's, will you let them out? Will you let them go? But will you let them in? Will you actually let that person who is no longer the person you loved, will you still, do you still have a place for them in your heart? Because I got to be honest with you, I'll be brutally honest with you, the more ill Caroline became, the less she resembled the person I knew, the more difficult it was to find a place for her in my heart. Well, first of all, my heart goes out uh, to you mm-hmm. for your loss. But And thanks for giving some of the background because uh, I think it's, first of all, it's um, the candid reflection that you had about what you just said mm-hmm. also and getting the story that's why i love doing this is to really understand where it all flows from and not just when a a great song is released and just listening to it enjoying it which is also wonderful but to hear a little bit more about that but i don't want to take listen i appreciate all your time just a a couple final questions and and again the album is going to be coming out soon. i can't wait to hear the other songs from it including the song that you mentioned is your favorite from that what's what's the name of that song again Rivers of Mercy. Rivers of Mercy. So I really look forward to hearing that too, but the entire album. So you were working with some other songwriters initially several years ago, and 
and finding the tears for fears concept for for your own in your own mind relevance continuing on and making a statement and making an impact who are some of the artists or songwriters that matter to you today who you believe are the innovators that move you one of one of the guys that i had the the privilege to work with during this album was uh, mark foster from foster the people mm. and uh, you know the guy is the guy's a genius he's absolutely amazing so um i really like what he's doing i mean there are tons of other people i'm trying to think right now my brain's sit a blank uh, who was i listening to the other day <laughs> I think there's a band called Wet Leg. Hmm. <laughs> you got to check them out. I'll Been check like, them out. Wet Leg. Okay. White in uh, in uh, in Britain. They're uh, they're uh, pretty amazing too. Well, I'll, I'll check them out. But again, Roland, thank you so much. Just when do you have any tour plans? Yeah, we do. We uh, I think they'll be announced in November, uh, but we will be touring America, May, June, and then Britain in July. Okay, wonderful. I'm sure you're going to be coming to Los Angeles. Hopefully, you, you'll be coming down to San Diego, Hollywood too. Bowl, oh, Hollywood Bowl. Wonderful. I'll yep. be there. Brilliant. Hopefully, you'll make it down to San Diego, too. But really look forward to your, your album that's coming up again, everybody out there, the first in nearly 20 years. So it's, it's going to be, um, there's going to be a lot of ante anticipation for it. But Roland or Isabel from the great band Tears for Fears. Um, Roland is the songwriter as well as singer, as well as musician and all, all things. Thank you for joining us from Boston today or outside Thanks. of Boston. I should Thanks. say outside of Boston today for the story behind the song on the consequence podcast network. Good to see you, Roland. Cheers. Thank you.